Why, why are they that doctor? Good I know, day, ladies they, and they, gentlemen. They like me, mister. Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Palatin Technologies First Quarter Fiscal Year 2021 Operating Results Conference Call. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. Before we begin our remarks, I'd like to remind you all that the statements made by Palatin are not historical facts and may be forward-looking statements. These statements are based on assumptions that may or may not prove to be accurate in the actual results that may differ materially from those anticipated due to the variety of risk and uncertainties discussed in the company's most recent filings with the Security Exchange Commission. Please consider such risk and uncertainties carefully in evaluating these forward-looking statements and Palatin's prospects. Now I'd like to turn today's call over to our host, Dr. Carl Spana, President and Chief Executive Officer of Palatin Technologies. Please go ahead, sir. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the Palatin Technologies first quarter fiscal year 2021 call. I'm Dr. Carl Spana, CEO and President of Palatin. With me on the call today is Steve Wills, Palatin's Executive Vice President, Chief Financial Officer, and Chief Operating Officer. On today's call, we will provide financial and operating updates. We sincerely hope that you and your families are safe and healthy as you deal with life-altering changes brought about by the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm now going to turn the call over to Steve, and he'll provide the financial update as well as an update on Belisi. Steve. Thank you, Carl, and good morning, everyone. Regarding the first quarter, and it's September 30th, 2020, net loss for the quarter was $3.9 million, or $0.02 cents per share, compared to a net loss of $4.5 million, or $0.02 cents per share, for the comparable quarter of 2019. Vilesi gross sales for the period July 25th to September 30th amounted to $809,100. We recognize negative $288,560 in Vilesi net product revenue, and net being net of allowances and accruals. We recognize no contract and license revenue for the quarter compared to $97,379 for the comparable quarter of 2019. Total operating expenses for the quarter were $3.7 million, including a $1.6 million gain on the license termination agreement related to Vilesi with AMAG. This compared to a $5 million, uh, compared to $5 million of operating expenses for the comparable quarter of 2019. As of September 30, 2020, the company had $86.6 million in cash and cash equivalents and $5 million in accounts receivable, compared to $82.9 million in cash and cash equivalents and no accounts receivable as of June 30, 2020, and no outstanding debt. The amount of cash and cash equivalents of $86.6 million puts Palatin in a comfortable position to fund its anticipated operating results well through calendar year 2021. Regarding Vilesi, in July 2020, Palatin announced the mutual termination of its license agreement with AMAG Pharmaceuticals for Vilesi. Under the termination agreement, Palatin regained all North American development and commercialization rights for Vilesi. AMAG made a $12 million payment to Palatin at closing and will make a $4.3 million payment to Palatin on March 31, 2021. Palatin assumed all Vilesi manufacturing agreements, and AMAG transferred information, data, all the assets related exclusively to Vilesi, including existing inventory. AMAG is providing certain transitional services to Palatin for a period to ensure continued patient access to Vilesi and regulatory compliance during the transition back to Palatin. Palatin is reimbursing AMAG for the agreed-upon cost of the transition services. The accounting treatment of this transaction resulted in a $1.6 million gain on the license termination. Regarding Vilesi commercial activities, we've been pretty busy the last few months. To, to a certain extent, there was very limited support for Vilesi during the first half of 2020 and, and prior to Palatin regaining the rights. Some of the items that we have um, made what we believe are very positive steps are we've solidified the distribution network and procedures. 
We've improved contact and prescribers with prescribers and healthcare providers through virtual meetings. We've increased insurance reimbursement coverage, and we just recently initiated a highly selective digital marketing and telemedicine campaign to rebuild awareness and demand among premenopausal women with an initial geo-targeting approach to top prescriber and digital locations. Carl will expand on some of these points related to Vilesi and also give us a program update for Palatin's other uh, programs under development. Carl? My turn. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you, Steve. Um, you know, as we continue to operate under the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, a primary concern of ours has been the safety of our employees, our patients, and our healthcare providers and partners. As such, we've instituted a work from home policy in March. It continues to remain in effect for our office staff. However, our research laboratory is open and functioning. Fortunately for us, most of our key research and development partners continue to remain in operation. And by using teleconferences and various online meeting platforms, we have been effective in continuing to advance our programs. However, we understand with resumption of activities, there can be further disruptions to business activity based on resurgence of the virus, which is currently happening across the country and we will be prepared for this potential outcome. As Steve mentioned, in July 2020, we acquired Valdisi from AMAG Pharmaceuticals. Just as a reminder, AMAG's divestiture of Valdisi was based on strategic and operational changes at AMAG, and not on the potential value of Valdisi. Although Steve covered some of the details of our Valdisi commercial plan, there are a number of accomplishments that I would like to emphasize. When we reacquired Valdisi in late July, there have been limited marketing efforts and nominal focus on the distribution and patient access of Elisi. This has led to a suboptimal patient experience and very unfavorable economics. Under Steve's directions, we have assembled an excellent and motivated commercial team that has rapidly addressed these issues. Over the last quarter, we have solidified the Elisi distribution network, improved the patient experience by retraining our specialty pharmacies, and we have expanded insurance coverage. In addition, we are engaging with healthcare providers through virtual office visits and virtual meetings. These activities are leading to a much better patient experience, improved relationships with prescribers, and improved economics, and have laid the foundation for us to begin, as Steve mentioned, a selective geotargeting marketing campaign. These accomplishments that have been done at what I believe is a record pace have put us in a strong position to demonstrate the potential value of IVC in a cost-effective manner and obtain our ultimate objective the relicensing of Elisi to a committed partner, ensuring the continued availability of Elisi as a treatment option for premenopausal women with HSDD, or hyperactive sexual desire disorder, and a substantial return on our investment. As we move on, many of you know Palatin has a primary scientific focus on the melanocortin system, which is involved in the regulation of energy balance, including food intake, sexual function, and resolution of inflammatory responses. Our first successful melanocortin program was based on the role of the melanocortin system in regulating sexual function. This research work resulted in the discovery of ILISI and its eventual approval by the FDA as the first on-demand treatment for premenopausal women with hypoactive sexual desire disorder. Our current research focus is on developing drugs that target the, melan the ability of the melanocortin system to resolve or turn down inflammation. We have developed multiple drug candidates that in preclinical models have demonstrated the potential to resolve a variety of inflammatory conditions. And research conducted by us and others have shown that targeting immune cells with drugs that modulate the melanocortin system results in the resolution of pro-inflammatory processes. These pro-resolution activities include mediating conversion of immune cells from inflammatory to regulatory states, the inhibition of the production of inflammatory or pro-inflammatory cytokines such as TNF-alpha and interleukin-6 and others, and the upregulation of anti-inflammatory cytokines such as interleukin-10. In addition, the melanocortin system plays a role in reducing the fibrotic response that occurs as part of many inflammatory diseases. The fibrosis resulting from inflammatory diseases has long-term negative consequences for the health of patients. Therefore, we believe that the melanocortin drugs will have broad utility in treating inflammatory diseases. We have developed clinical stage drug candidates for ocular diseases such as dry eye disease, other coronal disease indications, non-infectious uveitis, and retinal diseases. We also have a clinical stage drug candidate for gastrointestinal diseases such as ulcerative colitis. Our PL9643 is a melanocortin receptor agonist that began phase two 
study in dry eye disease using an eye drop formulation in January of 2020. Dry eye disease, also known as gratic conjunctivitis sica, affects the cornea and the conjunctiva of the eye, resulting in irritation, redness, pain, and blurry vision. Causes are varied, and we believe that by activating the melanocortin system locally, PL9643 will reduce the inflammation that underlies many negative aspects of dry eye disease. In July of 2020, the study was fully enrolled with 160 dry eye disease patients, and we are on track for data in December of 2020. The primary objective of this study is to provide the data required to advance PL9643 ophthalmic solution into later stage clinical trials, which would start in the first half of 2021. With data coming before year end, I would like to review the trial design and our regulatory strategy. Endpoints for dry eye disease clinical studies are divided into two categories, signs and symptoms. A sign is direct evidence of disease, and examples are corneal lesions and tear productions. Symptoms are patient experience aspects of disease, and examples are blurry vision and itchy eyes. PL9643 Phase II study is a multicenter randomized controlled study comparing PL9643 to placebo with a 12-week treatment period. The co-primary endpoints are a sign of dry eye disease, which is corneal, inferior corneal fluorescein staining, and a symptom, which is ocular discomfort measured by a validated PRO scale. We have also included multiple secondary endpoints that measure PL9643 effects on signs and symptoms of dry eye disease. It is typical to use only a single primary endpoint in a phase two study with multiple secondary endpoints. However, after discussions with the FDA, we chose to use co-primary endpoints with the strategy that the current phase two study could potentially be used as one of the two required phase three pivotal studies if both of the co-primary endpoints are statistically significant. We have designed the study so that multiple outcomes support the advancement of the PL9643. These potential outcomes include statistical significance for one or both co-primary endpoints or other signs or symptoms in the primary or specific subpopulations that are part of the secondary endpoint analysis. Following the strategy reduces phase two risk and allows for the possibility that the phase two study may be used as one of the two required phase three pivotal studies. The market for dry eye disease treatments represents a substantial commercial opportunity, over $2 billion in annual sales, and continued growth based on patient demographics. We believe that the potential efficacy and favorable tolerability and safety profile of PL9643 will allow for substantial market penetration of the dry eye market. Now, moving on to PL8177 for pulmonary disease, in particular our COVID-19 program. In preclinical disease models, PL8177 has demonstrated anti-inflammatory activity and the ability to protect lung tissue from damage due to fibrosis. As a potential treatment for patients with COVID-19 infection, PL8177 may reduce the inflammation of lung fibrosis associated with progressive disease. In the second quarter of calendar 2020, we held discussions with BARDA concerning PL8177 as a potential treatment for patients with COVID-19 infections. And one of the outcomes of this discussion was the advice that we move PL8177 forward and begin discussions with the FDA concerning a potential clinical trial in COVID patients. In the second quarter of 2020, we submitted a pre-IND data package to the FDA and received detailed advice on the requirements to progress PL8177 into clinical studies. Following our current PL8177 COVID-19 plan, we are conducting all the required activities needed to file an investigational new drug app application or an IND and have begin clinical studies in COVID-19 patients. These include such activities as clinical protocol development, selection of a CRO, clinical trial site identification, and the manufacture of PL-817 placebo in active doses. However, the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted our ability to complete the required manufacturing activities due to a delay in acquiring the syringes needed to manufacture active and placebo doses. We anticipate that we will not be able to complete the PL-8177 manufacturing until the first half of 2021. Until these activities are completed, we will not be able to file an IND and begin a study with PL-8177. As discussed in previous calls, press releases in our 10K, the landscape for treating and conducting clinical studies in COVID-19 patients is rapidly evolving, which impacts the design, risk, and ability to conduct clinical studies in COVID-19 patients. As we have considered the risk and uncertainty of conducting COVID-19 clinical studies, the start of the PL-8177 clinical study is subject to receiving external funding and operational support, and we are in the process of applying to government programs that provide such support. 
For earlier this year, we applied to the government's active program to support PL8177, and we recently received a positive review, but were unfortunately informed that the active program is no longer funding earlier clinical programs and has prioritized the funding of only phase three programs. We continue to seek other sources of external support and look forward to hopefully finding successful support for this program. Our clinical trial for retinal disease indication is scheduled to begin in the second half of 2021. This is a slight delay due to the impact of COVID-19, and we are using the additional time to expand our scientific understanding of the melanocortin system in ocular diseases. Updating our oral colon release formulation for PL8177 as a treatment for ulcerative colitis and other inflammatory bowel diseases. We're conducting the required fleet clinical activities in drug manufacturing, and this program remains on track to begin a phase two proof of mechanism study in the first half of 2021. And finally, based on our research work in the natriuretic peptide system, our drug candidate PL3994, which is a natriuretic peptide receptor A agonist, is going to be evaluated in a phase 2A clinical study in heart failure patients with preserved ejection fraction. The clinical study is a collaboration with two major academic medical centers and is supported by the American Heart Association. I am happy to report that patient enrollment has begun and the first patient has been dosed. You can find additional information on our programs and on our website, www.palatin.com. <clears throat> In response to the pandemic, the executive management employees and board of directors acted quickly to adjust our business operations and we have been able to continue to advance our programs. In addressing the COVID-19 pandemic, we took immediate actions to ensure the safety of our employees, patients, and healthcare partners. Our ability to continue to advance our development programs and our healthy cast position will allow Palatin to emerge from the pandemic in a strong position. Our release of commercial activities have made significant progress. Under Steve's Will's directions, we have put in place an excellent commercial team that has addressed many of the deficiencies we inherited from AMAG Pharmaceuticals. And we have now begun a, a selective marketing of Vilisi. We continue to work with our Chinese and Korean partners, to, which are now advancing Vilisi into clinical studies and to support their regulatory submissions for ultimate approval and sale of Vilisi in those territories. We continue to believe in the value of Vilisi as a treatment for women with HSDD and view this as a major opportunity to increase the value of our company. For our dry eye disease program, we initiated and completed enrollment of a phase two clinical study we are on track for data in December and preparing to move forward if the data is positive. As we continue to look forward to the rest of 2021, we will continue to deal with the operational challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. We have a strong pipeline of novel clinical candidates and we will remain focused on their advancement. Based on the research work completed in the past year, we are positioned to start clinical studies in COVID-19 patients, ulcerative colitis, and one or more ocular disease indications in 2021. In closing, I would like to thank the Paladin team and all our development partners for their rapid adjustments to a new working environment and their continued dedication to the advancement of ILISI commercial activities and our other novel drug candidates. We'll now open the call to questions. Thank you. If you would like to ask a question, please signal by pressing star 1 on your telephone keypad. If you're using a speakerphone, please make sure that your mute function is turned off to allow your signal to reach our equipment. Again, that is star 1 to ask an audio question. We'll pause for just a moment to allow everyone the opportunity to signal. All right, our first question will be from John Newman from Canaccord. Hi guys, good morning. Thank you for taking my question. Um, first question is, just wondered how much longer uh, AMAG will continue to provide transli transitional services, excuse me, for Vilisi. And then also wondered if you could talk about um, potential licensing discussions for Vilisi and uh, what you'd be looking for here. Thanks. Hey, John, thanks for the question. It's Steve. I'll <clears throat> take this one and Carl will jump in with color. The, um, it, it's confidential on the period of time, but you know, suffice to say, it's, 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 it's going to be orderly. We, we negotiated with, with AMAG um, you know, what we think is a very reasonable uh, amount of uh, uh, amount of time regarding the transitional services, and um, th that th that also carries over. I think you know you're probably aware, AMAG is is in um, 
is, is going to be acquired by Covis. Uh, I believe that transaction is targeted to, to close very shortly, if, if not this month. Uh, so we don't see any, any issues with, with in, in that regard. Re, re, regarding regarding the, the relicensing, you know, say for the U.S. or the North America, um, you know, we are, you know, in, in multiple discussions where um, we're, we're trying to go about it in a what we call a very um, direct way in that the first few months post the, um, the termination of the license and us regaining the rights, there were just, as Carl did more than allude to on his presentation, uh, on his pre during his pre prepared remarks, there was just a lot of work that, that had to be done before we could, you know, if you will, have what we consider substantive, substantive discussions um, and move forward. So that is underway. Um, you know, it's, for the most part, it's, it's pretty traditional. We're looking for someone that, that plays in the female healthcare space, that landscape, uh, has the infrastructure, uh, and, and is committed. We, we have a lot of flexibility at Palatin because we can be a very supportive partner. Uh, depending on the company, the size, the focus, we could handle the CMC, uh, anything, you know, in a nice way other than, than the commercial efforts, even though we are, we are handling that right now. So I, I think that get, puts us in a position to be, uh, to be flexible. I think the, um, the work we've done in the past, uh, it's, it's, it's been less than four months that we've gotten the product back. Um, and to be clear, the suit wasn't completely tailored. Uh, in that regard. So we're, we, we, we do believe that we will be in a position at some point in the future to uh, seriously consider um, um, a relicensing and, and make the, the best decision for the shareholders. Carl? I, I'm not sure. I, mean, I, I think, uh, John, you know, I think, you know, John, Steve's a little modest. I mean, one of the things we've also accomplished is really, uh, which will help in the licensing, is really uh, stopping, to de stopping our dependency on, on uh, AMAC. So a lot of the things like manufacturing, Distribution. These agreements have already been transferred over to Palatin, so a lot of the things that you know um, will need to be in place so that you can have a, a valuable license and a, and a quick license turnover uh, are really you know transitioning or have already transitioned from AMAC to Palatin, and as you know we've been saying, uh, they needed attention and and they've now been cleaned up and and they're functioning. So you know, we would like to be able to turn over to the partner, you know, a, a, a like a well-oiled machine that's functioning, so that this can be just dropped into the bag, and they can just you know focus on the commercial activities. And I think that's the way that we'll get you know a maximal value for the product. And and a lot of those things have been done already, and, and I think relatively shortly that you know we really won't be that dependent on on AMAG for much of anything. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Our next question will be from Joe. And again, it's from H.C. Wainwright. Hey, guys. Thanks for taking the question. Um, so first, just uh, based on your earlier comments about AMAG and the sale to COVIS, I just wanted to uh, dot the final I here. So uh, is there anything that we need to be aware of with regard to the change of control, uh, number one? And then number two, when you look at the pipeline, uh, you are seeking additional – or you're seeking funding, um, external funding for the COVID-19 program for 8177. So I thought it might be a good opportunity to just give us a little bit of a reminder and me a little bit of a reminder with regard to the preclinical data that you have in hand that gives sure. you um, encouragement for the program. Thanks. Great. Sure. Uh, uh, just, uh, you know, dealing with um, the transition, uh, it, 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 we've already been in contact, and it's through Steve has really already been in contact with the COVID senior management. Uh, they confirmed that they are, you know, uh, will be in place and continue to, you know, support any other transitional services that we do need from them. So I don't think they'll be, they'll, like we just say, they'll be nominal with no impact of that of that uh, transition, which will close shortly. Well, moving on a little bit, you, you highlighted so for PL8177 um, for potentially as a treatment for COVID patients. We'll take that in a couple of, of directions. So from a preclinical standpoint, uh, you know, clearly we, we, we know that PL8177 through a variety of, of models has shown a, a suppression of, of, of production of pro-inflammatory cytokines. What was uh, quite uh, interesting to us and, and quite encouraging to us was really work that was done in a uh, model of, of lung disease, uh, w uh, which is for uh, interstitial pulmonary fibrosis, which is done, it's called the bleomycin model, which is one of the standard models that really looks at the effect of, of a drug to impact a lung fibrosis, which is really a key uh, uh, detriment in these in patients. And we showed really nice success in reducing the fibrosis that occurs in lungs in that model. 
so that so so there is a nice set of, of preclinical data from both the anti-inflammatory side and then from the uh, uh, anti-fibrotic side that really supports transitioning into clinical trials. And really, we've we've had review by uh, you know both the BARDA program and the active program, and, and the scientific reviews have been very positive. Uh, it's just that you know with the wealth of compounds moving through. And uh, you know, and the desire to have late stage compounds, uh, you know, we we uh, it, it's you know, we we wind up with great scientific reviews, but you know, come back when you get ready for phase three type of responses. So uh, what we're doing along those lines is we've actually uh, brought in a group that specializes in and helping to get uh, funding for uh, programs such as PLA 177, and uh, we're resubmitting grants and, and other applications to get for support. Unfortunately, because we've had a little bit of a delay in the manufacturing, we will have the time to, to play these things out. Uh, irrespective of the financing, uh, if it comes in or not, we, we may choose not to go forward if we don't get financing in COVID patients, but we do believe in the value of PL8177 for treating um, you know, acute lung diseases in general. And we, do, we would look at maybe moving in a, in a different indication that may be easier for us to get at you know, clinical trial sites and patients. Um, that uh, you know that it would be harder to do in, 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 with COVID patients right now without support. So we do think that it will go forward in, in lung disease in, in one manner or another. It's just not clear until we really play out the granting process and, and the external funding process, which way we're which, which way we'd go. Got it. Very helpful. Thanks, guys. Looking forward to a lot of important catalysts in the near future. Us too. Thank you. Our next question will be from Michael Higgins from Landberg Dalman. Good morning. This is Edward on from Michael. I appreciate you guys taking our questions. Um, just starting with Vilesi here. Uh, it looks like there was a $1.1 million charge in the quarter um, that generated the negative net sales. Uh, just wondering if, if that's correct and whether this is a recurring charge. Um, and in terms of net margin, I'm just wondering what we should look for in the next few quarters. Uh, hey, it's Steve. Um, well, if that number is not correct, I have to talk to um, our outside auditors, um, but it, it is correct. The, the strategy out of the gate by AMAG was about demand. Um, they did not, if you will, have certain procedures in place where you'd have the insurance reimbursement. That was just not their initial strategic uh, strategy. They, they were going to evolve into, if you will, instituting those procedures where you you'd get the insurance reimbursement. Um, they started the uh, you know, procuring coverage, expanding the coverage, and then the divestiture process started. So what, 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 you'll, what you see is, if, if you understand how, how Vilesi is being uh, distributed and, uh, and sold, the first script, and the script being defined as for uh, auto injectors, Palatin subsidized, and AMAG had done it prior, subsidizes uh, 100% of that. So that means the patient has zero dollar copay, um, zero out of pocket for the first for the script, first script. All subsequent scripts, the refills, their out of pocket cannot exceed ninety nine dollars. So what you have is a little bit of a perfect storm right now as we got the product back in that we're expanding the coverage and I think we're we're making some very significant increases in that regard. But we importantly we adjusted the procedures with the specialty pharmacies whereby we are seeking insurance reimbursement uh, on all the doses. So as of right now, you have a very substantial amount of, say, offsets, uh, the rebates, the allowances from the, say, the positive gross, uh, the gross sales. That, for this period, resulted in, in net sales. Um, as we go forward, that's going to be uh, turned to positive sales and ideally significant positive sales. A little bit further down in the statement, we also had the cost of the cost of goods sold. You can see that it's we, we have a very very good margin. Um, even you know once we are, you know, get get some things in place and, and and the insurance reimbursement and the demand is is, is moving in the right in the right direction, <clears throat> our gross profit margin will exceed 90 percent. So the, the takeaway there, um, Edward, is this is a timing difference. We've remediated certain procedures and processes. They're in place now, and it is increasing uh, every week and every month. 
All right, that sounds great. I appreciate that clarity. Um, and just as a follow up on that point, uh, it looks like you have, you know, sales were about 800,000. You have a $5 million run rate for the year. Um, and then are these initial revenues then based on demand or does it include some of the stocking and destocking uh, from the AMAG transition? You know what, we're, we, we believe the, I, I wouldn't extrapolate from what we just did for July 25th through September 30th, as, as, as Carl highlighted in his pre prepared remarks, uh, and I commented there, th there was work to be done before we could move forward with the uh, attacking the, uh, the awareness and, and the demand. The, the insurance coverage needed to be expanded. Pre certain procedures to allow for insurance reimbursement needed to be uh, modified and corrected uh, at the specialty pharmacy level. So uh, our, uh, our position is that, that, that demand will increase uh, and ideally significantly as we go forward. We, we did also just recently start um, this geo-targeting uh, digital marketing uh, campaign. And you might say, well, yeah, recently, you know, recently be within the last few weeks. And even though we've had the product for a little under four months, it, it, it would have made no sense to, to start that campaign prior. Uh, you don't want to increase the demand and also, if you will, have a negative, negative impact on, on, on what type of uh, revenue dollars and cash dollars you were, you were ignoring as the, as the manufacturer. So we believe we're in a really good position with that to, as we're attacking the demand going forward, to, uh, to have that upswing in the uh, demand curve. Just, I'm going to just, I'm going to just kind of maybe put it in, in, in since I'm not an accountant, uh, unfortunately, you know, according to Steve, uh, I'm going to put it in more blunt terms. You know, what we inherited was a product that was really just aborted, and it had a negative, you know, uh, net sales. We we couldn't tolerate that. We 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 need to make money when we sell uh, or fill up our lease script, and we needed to put a lot of things in place to do that, and we've done that now. Uh, so we're now in a position where we, we can work on increasing the demand because instead of having instead of incre increased demand costing us money, we're now going to make money. I don't know, maybe I'm a little silly. I, I, I think when you, when you sell something, you want to make money when you sell it. So um, we needed to fix, put in place the infrastructure that allowed us to do that. And that, that's now the case, and that's going to expand. Uh, as you know, Steve, again, being a little bit modest, we have good insurance coverage, and we're, and we're going to have even better as we get into the new year. Uh, we've got a great team working with us, and we're expanding coverage, uh, you know, almost every day. Any other questions? Sort of, yeah, you sort of preempted my next question there. Um, you mentioned on the previous call about the digital marketing campaign and the coverage, and you provided a few numbers around that. I was hoping you could talk a little bit about uh, how much you're investing, uh, what sites you're looking at for the digital marketing campaign, and then if you could provide any updates on the coverage um, compared to the last quarter's call. Yeah, hey, it's Steve. The, the the coverage coming in, um, and and it was it was it was really advancing as we were taking the product back uh, from AMAG was in that 50% range. We were able to get that into the uh, into the mid 60 range. You know, the mid 60 range being defined as the covered lives out there, which is the uh, the ac acronym that that people uh, use, and we're but we're we're aggressively moving forward. We 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 have. Um, uh, a third-party uh, expert consultant that's assisting us in, in this endeavor, and uh, our target is to, is to clear 75, if not 80 uh, percent, by, by the first quarter of next year. The, um, so that's about as much, you know, specificity I can give around um, uh, the coverage, and it's always confidential on on the type of uh, who's covering us. But it's, you know, the general rule of thumb is there's there's five main covers. Uh, coverage groups that, that handle, if you will, 80% of the of the covered lives. So we're in, we're in a pretty good position there. We're not seeing any any pushback once we get once we get the right person and and the right attention. Uh, this is a uh, a product that's on demand. We don't have any safety issues. Uh, the you know the, the pricing and things of that nature are uh, th there's no pushback in that regard. So it's just a matter of of a timing difference again. So our our, our plan is to Come, you know, by, by during the first quarter that we'll have north of 75 is not 80 percent of covered lives. Okay, excellent. That's exactly regarding the digital that. marketing, yeah, regarding the, the digital marketing, it's, I mean, we're, we're, not a, we're not a full commercial activity. We don't have a sales force, and I, I, I believe, and Carl believes, and a lot of other people, there'll probably be limited impact on a sales force uh, during the, uh, this stage of the uh, pandemic. So we're, 
we're utilizing the, the digital marketing, the, the Facebooks, the Instagrams, the telemedicine. And it's, it, the investment is you know, what we think is reasonable. It's, it's, it's between $500,000 and maybe $750,000 uh, for the first few months. You know, as you're laying, layering the uh, the foundation in there. Thereafter, it's it, it probably will go down maybe 50 percent. Um, and and as, as I mentioned earlier, this is a geo targeting. We're you know we, we view this as you know um, a heightened proof of concept, right? We're not going out national. There are certain areas that we want to show that if you invest the dollars, you have the impact, you have the uh, the demand, you have the the, the value proposition regarding the uh, the net sales. And um, that's going to put us in a what we believe you know a much better position regarding the relicensing. Okay, makes sense. And then um, just one final question on 9643, um, just about the phase three um, going forward. Just if you could provide you provide a little bit of timeline um, for the outlook. Um, if you could also touch a little bit on the cost uh, and the likelihood of partnering or retaining this asset, depending on the phase two results and going forward. I mean, it's just in general terms, um, if if we're you know, if we have positive outcome and we're fortunate enough that we're we're running a full phase three program next year, you're going to be it's going to be about twenty million dollars to complete all of the activities uh, you know, for a full phase three program, meaning all the manufacturing, additional tox work, uh, validation work, all the clinical work, and being in a position to get those studies done. They would be done next year. The good thing about dry eye studies is they're very quick. So if we start them. You know, in the first half of the year, they'll be done in the second half of the year, and, and you're in a position to file. So it's a very rapid program, um, and it's not you know for for a phase three program that would lead towards an, uh, an NDA submission. It's not particularly expensive, but it would be in the twenty million dollar range to, to really conduct all the activities we would need to do, and then uh, and then be in a position to file an NDA late like late next year or early in in, in 2022. Okay, so it sounds like you'll be doing this in house then. Uh, you know, I mean, we, we until we have the data and we we see it. Um, you know, we we certainly have had uh, uh, you know Steve handles a lot of the business development activities, and we certainly have had preliminary discussions with uh, with potentially larger you know companies that would be interested in a dry eye product. But really, until you have the data and uh, you know your regulatory path forward is fully clear, you know you can't you, you know you can't do much. You know, no one's going to do a deal with us uh, with data pending. So when that data comes out, we certainly will look at uh, business development options uh, if they're on the table, uh, and we'll, we'll go from there. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you guys. That's all for me. I appreciate all the details. Thanks, Ed. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the question and answer session today. I'd like to turn the call back over to Carl Spano. Great. Well, thank you. I'd like to thank everyone for participating on the call. Uh, good questions that we received helped us clarify um, what's going on in the company. We look forward to continuing to update you uh, as uh, things occur. I'm sure I'd be surprised if we don't have another call uh, based around the data coming out from the dry disease study uh, in December. We look forward to that, and we look forward to keeping everybody informed of the progress that we're making here. Uh, you know, the team here is working quite hard, and, and uh, there will be a lot of accomplishments that are coming and, and will continue to come. So thank you. Be safe. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This concludes today's teleconference. You may now disconnect.